<laughs> Welcome aboard to Systems Biology, <laughs> class number four. Um, as always, we start our class uh, by taking, if you'd like to take a nice, deep, nice, 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 deep, deep, deep breath, breath, breath. Um, today's uh, subject is timing, memory, and the global structure of transcription networks. And I'd like to um, just orient us by where we are in the arc, arc of the course, between the beginning of the course, four weeks ago, and the end of the course in about seven weeks. This is our time together. Hmm. Uh, we're about here. And in this section of the class, we're, we're here. And in this section of the class, we talked about one, primarily we're talking about one design principle, which is uh, that uh, complex uh, transcription networks are built of relatively simple network motifs. So this will be, today will be the last uh, time class in this particular, thi talking about this design principle and we'll, hello, welcome, let's take a nice deep breath in your honor. <laughs> and uh, Today we'll talk about network motifs, the, the, uh, all, the, all the rest of the network motifs. We'll talk about it completely, we'll exhaust all the network motifs we know about in transcription networks, the t function for timing and memory, and we'll talk about how the motifs fit together to make the global structure of the network, how they fit one with respect to the other. And then we'd say goodbye to this topic. And we'll have another um, third of the class, more or less, talking about robustness. And here we'll describe uh, systems in bacteria, in the, in the development of uh, an egg into an embryo. And finally, we'll talk about optimality. Uh, basically, about the, the one theory that we have in biology, evolution, and how it relates to the structure of the structures and we see in, in inside the cell. So that's where we are. And um, as a review of the last three classes, we talked about transcriptional networks and network motifs, which are patterns that occur again and again and again. Each one can carry out specific dynamical functions or information processing functions. Uh, we talked about negative autoregulation and positive autoregulation, speed up and stabilization of uh, levels, delay and widening of stochasticity. We talked about the feedforward loop as a sign-sensitive delay element and this incoherent feedforward loop as a pulse generator and response accelerator. In fact, if you notice, we talked about three ways to speed up responses. First way is to increase the protein's degradation and removal rate. In order to get to a certain steady state, that means you also have to increase the production rate. So that comes at, at a cost. The second way is negative autoregulation, where you start making the transcription factor and then it slows down its own <laughs> transcription rate and you reach a desired steady state faster than if you just produce it at a constant rate aiming for that same steady state. And the third way is this incoherent feedforward loop where you can make a protein Z and then at a delay stop making it as quickly. That also can uh, s speed up the responses. The advantage of this design is that it works for any protein Negative autoregulation works only for protein that can slow down its own production, namely a transcription factor. This can work for any protein. It doesn't have to be a transcription factor. 
So three ways to speed up we, we saw so far. And um, today we'll talk about um, the remaining network motifs that together make up the transcriptional networks of organisms like E. coli and yeast and single-celled organisms and multi-celled organisms. We'll talk about uh, transcription networks that uh, govern changes from egg to embryo and their network motifs and how all these motifs fit together. So uh, we're here now. Let's take another nice deep sigh of relief. <laughs> Welcome. Um, we'll talk about um, the single input module. I, I want to say that uh, when, you, when we look at E. coli, yeast, this transcription network is made out of uh, basically f four types of network motifs other regulation feed forward loops that we talked about, and single input modules and these dense overlapping regulons we'll talk about today. So today we'll finish all this repertoire of the E. coli and yeast, and then we'll talk about additional ones found in, in other organisms. So the single input module is, again, a pattern that occurs many times, let's say at least 20 times in E. coli transcription network. Uh, it's very simple. It has a transcription factor that regulates itself, and it regulates set of genes. Writing our N is the number of genes that it regulates. What defines it, in addition, is that um, no other inputs. So um, there's no other inputs to any of these genes. Just a single input. And that's unusual in a, in a network to have one <coughs> node connected to 13 others, let's say, with no other en entry point. That's, that's found um, very often in E. coli and yeast. And an example is, example, is um, uh, E. coli needs to make, you know, E. coli, as I said, can grow on, on very limited uh, materials. If you take water and you put in sugar that basically supplies carbon, and salt that supplies nitrogen, phosphorus, a little bit of sulfur, magnesium, zinc, it can grow. That means it can make all of the amazing molecules uh, of the cell, including DNA, proteins, the 20 amino acids that, uh, that make up the proteins. It synthesizes from this, taking this sugar, take it, breaking it up, taking the carbon, putting it back together to make all the, all the molecules. It's an amazing chemical factory. Uh, for example, um, E. coli can make the amino acid arginine, which has molecular weight of about 100, like 100 hydrogen atoms equivalent uh, from, from sugar. And the way it does it, is by a set of proteins called enzymes that sequentially take the carbons and <coughs> connect them. And they're called Arg A, Arg B, Arg C, Arg D, Arg E. You see, they're required these biological names you must have noticed have this um, sometimes indecipherable things like P53, PSF1, etc. In this world of E. coli, Arg means that if you make a mutation and destroy this protein, it can't uh, grow unless you supply arginine into the test tube. That's what Arg means. Mm -hmm. So classically, the way to decipher what genes do is to break something and see, as you say, make a mutation, see that E. coli has a defect, usually a specific defect, and see what happens. And the they're all regulated by a repressor. 
RGR repressor, which negatively autoregulates itself and negatively regulates these guys. Each one sits on a different operon, has a different regulatory region, etc. And when arginine, this small molecule, this amino acid comes, it Um, relieves this repressive effect. So when arginine, this protein RGR is made out of, is a hexamer, when arginine binds it, uh, sorry, it's the opposite. When arginine, uh, <laughs> arginine, uh, the arg if arginine is available, it activates the repressive ability of RGR. So when arginine is available, these genes that make up arginine aren't expressed into protein, yeah? So, in fact, if this is the initial chemical, this turns it into a different chemical. These chemicals have nice names like ornithine and citrulline and all these names. And in the end, you get arginine in the cell. So if you're making arginine, you stop producing the machines that make arginine. That's the way this works. So, of course, the single input module has one function that's obvious, which is to uh, um, express C1 to Zn together when needed. But it also has um, an additional more subtle dynamical function, and that is um, the sim can generate a defined temporal order of expression. Expression is, of course, order of making these um, gene products, and let's analyze that function. So this activity of this attrition factor, by the way, if it's an activator, it usually activates itself and activates these genes. If it's a repressor, it represses itself in these, these genes, but there could be other combinations as well. Um, in, this, in the feed-forward loop and stuff, we discuss situations where this attrition factor activity changes suddenly, like a step. But for this to work, we need situations where attrition factor activity changes gradually. For example, in the arginine system, uh, if there's no arginine, then you have to make all these proteins that can take many, many minutes, and then they start making this arginine until it reaches a level where it starts to be, to be active. That can take a long time, so you have a gradual buildup of the signal. That's X, right? The signal. So uh, let's imagine that the signal builds up. Let's look at the um, proteins downstream. In order to understand the timing, we need to remember that each of these arrows carries a number. This number is the threshold, the concentration of X star needed in order to activate or inactivate that particular promoter. These thresholds. <coughs> K. I is the concentration of X star needed to activate or repress the ZI promoter. Would you expect it to be a threshold in our continuous function? The question is, would I expect it to be a threshold and not a continuous function? So that's a very good uh, question. So just to review, in general, each that I has an input function <laughs> where its production rate, the production rate, is a function of x star. Let's imagine uh, a repressor just for now. Make it lar larger. 
uh, is a continuous function. This is a repressor. And this k, well, for our discussion now, we'll approximate this by a step function. Because a lot of these uh, functions are, in fact, very sigmoidal and sharp. So for first approximation, you need to know that halfway point. Halfway point. This is halfway of the maximum induction. This is an approximation we make in order to uh, give us an intuitive understanding. Of course, you can solve everything also with continuous functions. This is called the step function or logic approximation. Then we just need to know one number, which is the threshold is half. We also need to know maybe the height, the maximal production rate. Okay, so uh, so let's uh, let's imagine that these K1 and K2 they're different, and in general they're different because each of these genes has a different promoter, and there's a different binding site for Rg R for X, and these sites can be positioned differently with respect to the gene, have different sequences, which translates into a different threshold. And evolution can play with mutations, etc., to change that threshold. So that's a tunable parameter over. Uh, evolutionary times, hundreds of generations. So let's imagine that um, this is the threshold for the first gene and this is for the second gene. Then what we see is that Z1 uh, starts being made here. And Z2 starts being made here. So the higher the threshold, here I drew this for I drew this for an activator. Of course, if if we had a repressor, then same picture but reversed. Right? So here is this a case for X is an activator. Okay, that's fine, and you can evolution can now tune this order. First, second, third, fourth. And indeed, when we, m we measure the promoter activity of these genes in living cells, you find that th this single input module, the arginine sing single input module, shows a temporal order of activation. And the order you find from looking at the cells matches the order of the biochemical pathway, of this factory pathway. So the first gene, A, is also the first one to be, to, to be made. And the second one is the second, etc. So temporal order matches uh, functional order. The order of magnitude of this temporal differences is minutes, about a tenth of a cell generation time. And it also matches the time it takes for each of these protein enzymes to make enough of its product to reach the 50% point of the next enzyme. That takes minutes. Biochemical pathways, people usually think, work in time scale of seconds. And it's true that if the cell doesn't have arginine, it runs out of its internal supply of arginine within, let's say, seconds. But to make the, the, the uh, arginine to reach the, the levels needed for the cell to grow. The time scale here is minutes. So again, what E. coli is doing here is what's called just-in-time production, not making a protein before it's needed. Yeah? How does it make the new enzyme if you don't have arginine? Yeah, so the question is, if we run out of arginine, how can we make new enzymes? So the cell in this situation cuts up the proteins it already has and salvages their amino acids to make new enzymes. And that way, it can change its, its composition without making new biomass. <coughs> However, this uh, design has built into it the following feature 
that the um, deactivation order, let's look at the deactivation order. So let, let's imagine now uh, we have this situation, the signal goes away. What's going to happen to the deactivation of the genes? So what about Z1? It goes, it goes off here. And Z2? Here. So what's the relation between the activation order and the deactivation order? He waited for someone to... Opposite, yeah. It's opposite. That's one moment. Uh, this is called in computer science, last in, first out. The last in, Z2, is the first out. Default order. Last in, first out. Like a um, stack. You put some balls into a tennis ball box. The last one you put in is the first one you take out. And uh, somebody said that this is uh, may have unneeded functional consequences. If you're building a machine and you want the first part, second part, third part, etc., when you want to turn it off, you would like to turn it off in the same same order. So um, now, luckily, often in biology, it's asymmetric. Sometimes. Uh, you know, like, like in the arginine case, making arginine is slow, but when the cell run out, runs out of arginine, it's a very fast dynamics, and then it doesn't matter what the temporal order is. So only one, one direction is important, and then single input module is just fine. It just cares, quote unquote, about the slow part. Depends on the system. But in some systems, it's both sides are slow. Both activation and deactivation are slow. And so the question is, how can we, how can, the cell make um, a first in first out order or FIFO. So a single input module. There's, there's plenty of them and there's been experiments on several also DNA damage repair, the Lex A system I mentioned before has a deactivation order that matches the functional order, severity of the repair. Activation order is fast. That's also a single input module. But we need a different circuit in order to get FIFO. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, the activation threshold, yeah. are they, uh, they are robust enough against mutation? Because if the K1 will go up a little, K2 will go down a little, all the order will... Uh, so the question is, are the KIs robust against mutations? If we change KI a little, yeah. uh, you can get a reverse order. Yeah. So um, yes, the, KI, the order is indeed very sensitive to the KI. Luckily, or the way you I, th I suggest you think about it is that uh, these things that are encoded in the DNA are, very, uh, are the same between cell to cell. And they change very slowly on evolutionary timescales, that is to say, every generation, one in 10 to the nine cells will have a mutation. And if this mutation, uh, let's say changing temporal order, happens to give an advantage, it'll start taking over the population. But that can take, let's say, 100 generations. So on the time scale of 100 generations, you have the design that, uh, for the m so that's encoded in the DNA. And that's why we don't worry about robustness to mutations in bacteria, and robustness to mutations in yeast. Because they are the, uh, I, I would say even that if there's a cell where there's a mutation that does something harmful, <coughs> that cell that, that mutation will be purified out by selection. In our bodies, however, our cells here are getting mutated quite often, and our cells do need to be robust to mutations because is be within one generation of human beings, we'll get uh, millions and millions and millions of mutations in our cells. And then there are special mechanisms that need to be robust to mutations, but not in bacteria and, and yeast. So, so. 
It's actually, this is quite a kind of a confusion in the field about robustness. In each case, you need to know what's the likely sources of error in, in a given generation. That depends on the organism, etc. I hear a question. FIFO, first in, first out. Um, if you're making a machine, like the flagella I'll talk about, machine means a multi-protein complex, and you need to make one protein after another to assemble it. Now when you stop assembling it, it makes sense to stop the first, the second, and the third, so that the parts already there can form the last flagella, the last machines. Did I answer your question? Think about it. <laughs> So in order to uh, learn about this, let's just take a look at the network. Um, sim, arginine, temporal order, LIFO. And, and um, look at the, there at the four node patterns. There are 199 potential four node patterns. So again, we're learning from the network about what circuits are there. And I'm not going to draw the 199 potential four node patterns. You can imagine that they, there is, of course, uh, a large number of possibilities connecting four genes. Uh, 199 directed connected four node subgraphs. And I think there's 9,005 or so ni five node subgraphs, etc. And of course, they all can occur in E. coli. Again, when we look at what actually occurs in E. coli, yeast, and higher organisms, we find um, that, in fact, very, very few of them occur. And there's two network motifs, or two network motifs. And those are motifs. <coughs> We're going to connect it to the FIFO order soon. The first one is the multi-output feed-forward loop. It just generalizes to multi-outputs with multiple outputs. Three, four, five, six, twenty. And the second one is this one. Which is uh, by fan, call it. It has overlapping regulation. And this generalizes to these big gate arrays called dense overlapping regulons that we'll talk about soon. So again, a, a huge simplicity. Of the 199 possible patterns, only two occur. And we can uh, understand them. Multi-output feed-forward loop. By the way, you know, you could have, even looking at the feed-forward loop, you see these are two feed-forward loops stuck together. There could have been other possibilities. There could have been a multi-input feed-forward loop. I mean, why not? This doesn't occur, very rarely. But it is a huge network motif in neuro neuro ne neuronal networks in the brain of the worm C. elegans, for example. So uh, again, interesting to think what, what this can do, what this can do. Or maybe having f two, two internal no nodes, Y1 and Y2. There's different, these are called generalizations of network motifs. You can build generalizations and see which ones occur, et cetera. So only two network motifs, which is uh, a huge simplicity rel relative to what might have been in, in a network with this size, density, et cetera. We're going to talk about both of them. We're going to zoom into this one, the multi-output feed-forward loop, because it connects to this FIFO order.
So um, the multi output before loop can generate people order. And uh, the example uh, is in the flagella uh, system. So again, uh, when you call a starves and starts making these motors, about, um, let's say, six to ten motors per cell, which are um, connected to a flagella, which rotates at about 100 hertz, pushes the cell 30 microns per second. Uh, it has an inboard computer that we'll talk about in the next classes, telling the cell where to go. So if you put some <coughs> nutrients like amino acids, like arginine somewhere, and it's starving, it'll swim there up the gradient. And we'll talk about how this flagella system is made. So I mentioned this before in the last lecture. It's actually, um, it has two transcription factors, which control um, the different um, flagella subunits that make up this motor. And this has rings and rods and shafts and amazing mechanics, electromechanics, because it works on protons. E. coli keeps a voltage difference between the inside and the outside. So protons going in, 1,000 protons going in provide the torque for one rotation. And this, they go through these helical proteins. A lot to understand on, on how this motor works. Now we'll talk about the order of these proteins are made. There, there are several of them, right? I'm drawing only two. And uh, if you, might, you might recall that they, ha they have OR gates here. So this is, in fact, a multi-output, coherent type 1 OR gate feedforward loop. <laughs> and, um, and let's just analyze this FIFO order, or the order, the way it's designed. So what do you think? Huh, we need some k's here, right? k1, k2. And here we'll call this k prime 1 and k prime 2. Hmm? Hmm? These are the thresholds. And uh, now we, we make x go up. And um, now because it's, a, it's an OR gate, uh, w if X is becomes active, we don't need to worry about Y, right? Yeah. Y has its own uh, activation threshold, so somewhere Y will be activated at a delay, but we don't need to worry about that right now. So we need uh, to we'll write down K1 and K2. And we see that... Uh, Z1 will Z1 Z2 will rise here and Z2 will rise here. And that's fine. That's just like the single input module. That's temporal order determined by the Ks. Now if that was all, the, the deactivation order will be determined by the same Ks. But 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 this is a feed forward loop, so there's the Y. And the Y when X turns off the Y turns off at a delay, KY, right? this is KY. Now, when X turns off, because it's an OR gate, the Z genes don't care about X because Y is still around. So what determines the deactivation order is a different set of Ks, it's the, y, it's the K primes the ones that come from Y. K prime to K prime. And I'm, I'm, I'm making these 
I'm saying if the feedforward loop is designed so that, oh, k prime, so k1 here is smaller than k2, but k prime 1 is larger than k2 prime. So for y, the thresholds are the opposite order than for, for x. And that's the way they're designed in this feedforward loop in the flagella system. That's the way evolution has tuned those numbers. Then Z2 cares about this num this whereas Z1 cares about this number. And we have FIFO order because the first gene turned on is the first gene turned off. Did I explain myself? By the way, you might notice that I'm not asking, do you understand? I'm saying, do I explain myself? Because to remind me, that it's my responsibility that you understand. Right? So is there any question? How do we know that the, so now we learned that the, it was designed with only two people. How do we know that this is what the goal was? So the question is, now that we uh, analyze this design experimentally, as, as Shiraz Khalil did uh, in my lab, how do we know, so, and we see this design, how do we know that this is what it was meant for, or its purpose? This is a teleological question connecting, uh, let's say, what we need to know is, in the natural environment of E. coli in which it evolved, is this the feature that provides a fitness advantage to the bacterium? And we don't know that right now. Those experiments haven't been done. I mean, they're being done now at this time, but in order to do those experiments, you need to, for example, one way to do it is to do evolutionary experiments where you compete in the lab. You can compete strains. What you can do, and this has been done, is mu do mutations that change these orders of K1 and K2 and see that the temporal orders are changed. Also, the maximum levels are changed. So you have to be careful to not to confuse cause and effect. And so in principle, it's possible to do evolutionary experiments on mutated circuits and compare designs. And that's the way to go. So yeah, that's one, one way to experimentally test hypothesis like this. So uh, it's, uh, these, these, uh, this way of analysis provides you with hypotheses that l can lead to experiments. And in fact, they do lead to experiments. question is, is it conserved across bacteria, this design? Uh, no, we don't. We don't know. Uh, what is conserved is uh, feed-forward loop. I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of this feed-forward loop for a system. Let's say if in E. coli, flagella system have a feed-forward loop. Other bacteria, which are very far away, like B. subtilis, which is uh, a completely different uh, part of the bacterial tree of life, also has a feed-forward loop for flagella. These genes that make up the flagella are very, very similar. These regulators are very, very different. It, what it, that means is that evolution converged on the same pattern two different times. It's not that the E. coli ancestor had a feed-forward loop that was preserved. It was rewired with different regulators and presumably for the same dynamical functions. Again, experiments that need to be done. And but it's a very important point. Network motifs aren't conserved, they converge again and again. So different organisms take different transcription factors and wire them up in the same regular fairy patterns to the, si to the structural genes which are conserved. And, um, and that's, uh, that's, that's important about there. The evolution of the arrows is much faster than the evolution of the shapes of the proteins. And so it looks like organisms can be very close on the tree of life that have very different networks if they live in different niches, like E. coli and its uh, um, close cousin that lives inside, uh, that, that's an that's a obligate parasite and has completely different structure. And two different bacteria that are very far in the tree of life but live in very similar niches converge independently on the same structure of circuits. The proteins are conserved, but the way they're wired together changes quickly. And that's also probably the way animals work, that our genes, you must have heard, Humans and chimpanzees, 98% similarity in the coding regions. So people ask, so what's, what makes the difference? What makes the difference is these regulations tell us when, where, and how much of each protein is made as you turn from an egg to an embryo to an adult. 
the wiring, the logic, the computation is what is fluid in the evolutionary timescales. One thing you portrayed off here is that it takes longer for the curve to uh, turn it off because of the delay of depending on the It takes long the point is it takes longer to turn off. And we said the also thing in the previous lecture that we perceive that this is um, again an, uh, a functional advantage of the OR gate feed forward loop, like an uninterrupted power source. So when you turn off the genes, you get extra time to finish the construction of the last flagellum, which matches the time it takes to construct a flagellum. So that what the point is I want to make is that these multi output feed forward loops carry all the, all the functions we or you already know of the simple feed forward loop. So each of, the, each of the outputs gains all those functions. If it's a sign sensitive delay or pulse generation, speed up, et cetera, depending on the feed forward. Plus, you can now have, um, by playing with these thresholds, different temporal, relative temporal timing, timing of the different events. Did I answer your question? Yeah, okay. Um, fantastic. Um, this is a good time to take a break. And uh, let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> a 10 minute break, so we come back at five minutes after. <laughs> Start again. Uh, let's start. Let's start the second day. <laughs> 45 minutes in the course and start by taking a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> Thank God we made it. A nice deep sigh of relief for Hannah. <sighs> Welcome back. So um, we're going to pause now for, uh, for a little feedback. I'd like to hear your, get your feedback on this course about how to make, because I want to know how to make it better. I want to teach you a little bit about feedback. In our culture and science, you might have noticed, uh, often feedback means telling somebody why you're smarter, why they're wrong. Mm -hmm. Feedback uh, in reality is made of two parts, equally important. What to keep and what to improve. Good feedback, and this is something uh, very important to teach to scientists because you get feedback and you also give a lot of feedback as reviewers, etc. <coughs> is concrete, concise, and constructive, the three C's. And it has two parts. Um, we call it plus delta. Plus is what to keep, specifically. Not saying like, uh, you know, uh, I like, uh, I like uh, your style or something like that, but something specific. And delta is something specific to improve, not saying something like, it's terribly hot in here, but if you turn on the air conditioner, it'll be easier to, s to study. Okay. And we work we're working on the air conditioning, so you don't have to use that particular one. <laughs> So what I'd like you now is to uh, take a, pi a piece of paper and a pencil and to answer in one sentence one thing that helps you learn in this course and one thing that you can suggest to us to improve about any aspect of the course. <laughs> All right. So we'll take about two minutes to do that. Anything right? I can't think of anything. Yeah, please take the time to write. Does anybody need paper or pencils? What? The music at the beginning of the class, yeah. What else? What? What about the graphs? The graphs help the intuition, what else? Menu, Menu. yeah. What else? Blackboard versus PowerPoint. 
What else? <coughs> what else? <coughs> okay, some some deltas. <laughs> Sorry. Pro provide a summary. Listen more, write less. Listen more, write less. Yeah. What else? Uh, reveal more of the problems, challenges in the field. Where things don't work. Yeah. What else? More biological examples? Mm -hmm. One more? More info on the example. OK. Thank you. And we'll take a look at what everything ro everyone wrote. Um, I just want to mention that the movies now are online on the Weizmann YouTube channel. The first class, at least, is online there. So you'll get to, s to uh, have a chance to re review. All right. Let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> Thank you for taking the time to, uh, to give the feedback. And um, we'll go ahead with our plan. Um, talk about the last motifs. Before that, I saw there's a question. So the question is, it seems like there's redundancy in the mechanism I showed because you can set up other parameters. Can you create a FIFO mechanism with only three proteins? I'm not going to answer. It's a great question to think about. Sometimes the teacher doesn't answer. Um, so the last motif in, the, uh, in E. coli stems from this um, By fan, <coughs> the there was a multi uh, multi output feed forward loop, and the by fan were the main four node structures, hundreds and hundreds of times. With what we saw so far, makes up virtually the entire network: uh, <coughs> feed forward loops, single input modules, by fans. More than ninety percent of the genes are in this network. The ones that aren't are probably not yet connected the ones that are kind of islands without connections, experimental information there is lacking. And this generalizes to dense overlapping regulons, which is a group of transcription factors and a group of output genes <coughs> with a lot of overlapping regulation. They're not fully wired, but they're much more dense than you might expect to find in networks of this size and density. <coughs> and these um, are, you can think about as um, gate arrays, because they compute <coughs> combinatorical <coughs> logic at the ZI promoters. For example, um, X1 and X2, X1 or X2, other combinations, not exactly logic functions. Um, X1 and X2 or X4. Things like that. And that's also used in electronics, of course, gate arrays. And so to understand these dense overlapping regulons, you need to map the input function, the multidimensional input function that translates the, the input transcription factor activities to the output promoter activity at each one of these genes. 
And uh, if you ask about challenges, that's one of the unknowns, big unknowns in networks. We know the arrows much better than we know the way they combine. We, d we, can, we are even worried because in E. coli, the average number of arrows going into the gene is two, and the range is between zero to six. In human cells, you can have genes that are regulated by 20 inputs. Can we understand the 20 input input function? <coughs> even if it's just a logic function, a 20 input logic function is, it can be an extremely complex object. So can we understand, are they separable? There's some information from E. coli that these input functions, so the rate of production of These input functions here, in uh, at least in E. coli sugar genes, they look like they separate. There's separation of variables. This is a very big simplification because it means you can measure one, instead of needing, let's say, n squared measurements to measure a two dimensional fi input function, you can measure n and another n, that's a 2n measurements to measure each one of these. So that's called separation of variables. But we don't know if this generalizes to other inputs, to, tw to those complicated 20 input functions in, in human cells. It's a <coughs> Again, I'm betting you there's some simplicity in these input functions, more than the most worst case scenario, which is incomprehensible to human minds, but that's, that's one challenge. E. coli has at least six of these DORs, and each one is responsible for a major task, like respiration, which means breathing, carbon utilization, which means eating, osmotic stress, which means surviving stress. Yeah specific kind of stress where you go into very dense or, or light uh, environments, etc. Each stationary phase where you go into kind of um, general stress and starvation. And, um, and they're the biggest network motif in terms of number of genes involved. So the next question is, how are all the motifs I've described arranged with respect to each other? How do they fit in to make a global picture? <coughs> um, and in order to do to answer that, we need to make a picture of the network. And, and of course, making a picture of a complex network is very complex. You, you get this, um, what's called in the jargon of systems biology, a fuzzball. When you try to draw, draw all the nodes and arrows, you get this kind of incomprehensible um, picture. But using network motifs, you can uh, make a picture that uh, a human being can understand by a coarse graining procedure where you draw a new network where each node represents an entire motif, not entire pattern. So you can, uh, all these dense overlapping regulons you can draw as a rectangle with their inputs and outputs and feed forward loops with multiple outputs you can draw, let's say, as a triangle and uh, single input modules as a square, let's say, that's inside it says how many genes are regulated. And when you do that, the E. coli transcription network um, looks like is a, is a cortex or one-dimensional array of DORs. So it looks like this. That is to say, you don't find 
a DOR at, at, at the output of another, like chains of cascades of these DORs, just one dimensional. And inside these DORs are feed forward loops. And what we represent as single input modules. So they're embedded inside. And the overall structure is in fact extremely shallow in the sense that the number of steps from the signal to the output genes is, is small. It's one step usually. Sometimes it's a cascade of two steps. Rarely it's three steps. And the world record is five steps. Why this shallow design? So we think the reason is response time. <coughs> Cascades take about one cell generation per step to respond. X1 gets a signal, activates X2. X2 needs to be produced. Cross its activation threshold for X3. Response time, as we saw before, in E. coli is the on the order of cell generation time. By the way, response time in this sense of in human cells, the how many human proteins are mainly diluted and not degraded? We recently measured that using a fluorescence tagging of human proteins. And again, about half the proteins in human cells have a major component of dilution by cell growth. So for about half of the e human proteins, response time in this sense is also 10 hours, half of a generation time, 20 hours a generation time. So, so that carries over between organisms. So in general, you have this arrangement all over all organisms? Or this arrangement, good question, this, question, this arrangement <coughs> seems to be found in sensory transcription networks. Soon we'll talk about other kinds of networks that need to respond rapidly and reversibly to external signals. That's the only kind, basically, that exists in E. coli and majority of things in single cell or organisms like yeast. And a big part of our transcription networks, the part that needs to respond to things like DNA damage, hypoxia, which means lacks of oxygen, et cetera. Sensory transcription networks. Soon we'll talk about another kind of transcription network that is ha guides an e uh, a, a fertilized egg to an embryo that has different constraints. But these class of sensory networks, as far as we know, seem to be built like this. Just want to tell you one interesting fact. Oh, I'll tell you in a second. All right, so we're. Um, Isn't it also good in terms of, I know it's a problem of evolvability, the ability to change things? Because if you have a lot of steps, you're dependent on a lot of them, a lot more mutations can kill you, and it's harder to shift because you have so many steps. It's a very open and an interesting topic. I'm not going to answer. Very good question. So we talked about these sensory networks that need to respond quickly, quickly, quickly to external signals. You want to respond, not your grandchildren. So you better respond in your generation, not, not the grandchildren's gen generation. Yeah? So the shallowness is only in the transcriptional network, right? Because you have signaling networks with the, I mean, there you do have the... 
The question is, how, what about signaling networks? And this is, um, yeah, for, for people who are new to biology, it's, it's very good, this question it reminds me to say that we're looking here at transcription networks. That's part of what exists in the cell. They're the networks that are the slowest. They have to do with making new proteins, degrading proteins. There's a much faster network of everything that happens from the, the signal to the activity of the transcription factor. And that has to do sometimes with something ju just as simple as a sugar binding the transcription factor. Sometimes it's a complicated thing where a hormone binds a protein called a receptor that changes its state and then uh, causes a chemical reaction called phosphorylation, adds a phos phosphor phosphoryl group to a protein that then changes state and adds a phosphoryl group to another kind of protein that changes state, adds a phosphoryl group to another kind of protein that changes state and then goes into the nucleus and there adds a phosphoryl group to a transcription factor that goes to the DNA. All this, let's say, in our cells can take minutes and then the hour hours process of the transcription network. So these are fast networks. They do have long cascades and they do have DORs that are downstream of other DORs making these um, interesting network motifs. They have other network motifs. The point there is that they're not rate limited. The basic reaction of this phosphorylation, for example, these chemical reactions, are much faster than, um, than, than usually than the biology you need. And therefore, you can allow yourself long cascades and other motifs. We'll talk about them in the next third of the course. Different motifs. So th the constraints of the hardware time scale uh, in relation to the time scale of the biological process you want to control affect, we think, dramatically the architecture that of the network you find, the network of motifs you find. To answer your question? So uh, I want you to think of the cell as having all one network, this uh, transcription network. On you can say take a transparency and draw in blue all the transcription arrows. On top of that, you can draw in red arrows all the chemical uh, interactions, the signaling networks. That's another kind of network. And m metabolism, this uh, chemical production, this in green. So you have these overlaying networks. Each one has different network motifs, different time scales, and they're integrated. And you can think about integrated network motifs made of several colors. And there's, there's, a, there's many research directions. A lot, of no a lot is known, too. We won't cover everything in this course, but certainly a lot to discover about how these networks are integrated. Great. Uh, let's talk about um, the, the other kind of transcription networks in animals. Anim animals and plants and even some bacteria. Um, there exists a second type of transcription network <coughs> that controls the development. Development is a word in biology that means um, going from egg to embryo to adult. Th these it has processes which are slow. They take more than one cell generation and irreversible, usually. Um, so if sensory networks are need to uh, fa function basically within the my generation of the cell, DNA damage, I need to respond now. Egg to embryo, you think about this problem. It's all this e embryo fertilized egg has DNA. It divides into two, four, eight, 16, same DNA. Some point cells need to decide if they're going to be a muscle cell, a skin cell, a brain cell, same DNA. The difference between muscle cell, skin cell, brain cell is the proteins they express and also some changes in the DNA and other things that is made after the fact. Which proteins to express is governed largely by developmental transcription networks. The decision of, you know, you start a muscle, it starts developing. Many cell generations have to remember, I'm a muscle, that's memory, and they need to, and it's slow. You don't need to change from muscle to brain cell every generation. So slow and irreversible. So in mem they, need, they need memory. And indeed, when you look at developmental transcription networks that don't exist in E. coli, but do exist in things like fruit flies and worms and mice and human beings and also some bacteria that need to undergo very complicated developmental processes because bacteria are people too. They, um, you find that there's other ne additional network motifs. So these networks have all, 
all the motifs we uh, learned about plus, and I'll tell you about additional motifs that they have. Okay. So they do have long cascades, and often they're cascades of repressors. And in the exercise, you'll be able to see why repress repressor cascades can have an advantage over activator cascades in terms of robustness. It's a problem solved by Namabakai's lab. And they have positive <coughs> two-node feedback loops. So that's something we didn't see in E. coli. And I'm going to explain what that means. So, you know, uh, when you think about two nodes, there is basically three kind of feedback loops that could exist because each of the two arrows could be positive or negative, right? This one, in terms of transcription, is very rare. These two, which are two positive feedback loops, plus, plus, and minus, minus, makes a plus, right, are common. This appears, by the way, in one of those mixed or hybrid network motifs I talked about where this is transcription, slow, this is, pr uh, it's a degradation or some other uh, interaction that's, you don't need to make new proteins. Phosphorylation, that's common. This is a hybrid or composite motif made of two types of interaction. usually separated at least by an order of magnitude in their time scales. Why negative feedback loops have separation of time scales like this is uh, quite clear from engineering. Uh, if you uh, want to control the temperature in this room, if we had uh, air conditioning here, let's say, if we were so lucky, then uh, you notice this heavy, heavy air conditioner that takes 15 minutes to, to cool the room is controlled by thermostat that compares the desired temperature to the actual temperature with very, very quickly. It's not that it there's a vat of mercury that compares the temperature to the desired temperature with a 15-minute response time, because too slow a negative loop with too slow reactions would lead to oscillations, because you x goes up, y goes up, and then x goes down, and then y goes down. And that's uh, generally not a good thing, and if you want to keep stability, a negative feedback loop made of uh, equal time scale interactions, like two transcription interactions, will oscillate and be noisy. And that's um, not desirable unless you're trying to build a clock. If you're trying to build a clock, there's a special network motif. This makes a great clock. I told you about a, uh, an anti-motif in, in the second lecture, I think. <coughs> this thing, which doesn't occur in the transcription network of E. coli. You can understand now why it doesn't occur in the, f in the, feed in the transcription network of E. coli. This is a feedback loop with three slow steps. And this, in fact, was built by Stan Leibler, Michael Elowitz, in bacteria by taking the repressors and engineering their promoters so that repressors repress each other and a green fluorescent protein. And you get E. coli that blinks, green, black, green, black, every few hours. Very noisy. One cell blinks. Like it's not like a perfect clock. But you can build a circuit like this and get a very robust oscillator. 
And, uh, in, and when you look at heart cells, circadian oscillators, the, the biological oscillators, they have a very complex design, but at the heart is something like this usually, not like this. So this is uh, one reason why you, you don't find these loops. So uh, let's just take a look of these two uh, positive, two node positive feedback loops. I'm going to add another piece of information. They usually have positive autoregulation. What's the difference between them? When would you use one and when would you use the other? So um, there's a, the, the main difference between them is that um, they ha they the thing that's united to both of them is that they can be locked in two, they can be lo locked into two different uh, steady state and stay there. So I'm going to add now another node here just to help us understand. Uh, so please forgive me, I'm going to um, add this Z here. That will be our input, something that turns it on. Correct. But give me the pleasure to say it also. So let's start the signal Z. So X starts to be made. And Y starts to be made. And when they cross each other's activation threshold, the, sig the signal is there for enough time. And it's built so that, you know, it's like an OR gate. You don't need Z. Z is not compulsive. You need to start, but you don't need to maintain. It's like an OR gate. Then what happens when Z goes away? So they have either um, a low, low fixed point or a high, high fixed point. And it stays. But that's memory. I remember Z was, uh, was here. Even now that it's gone. Right? This is a memory circuit. And bo both nodes are, are on, X and Y. And in fact, in our cells, this decision, for example, to go from a stem cell, which has the ability to become all kinds of cells, into a differentiated cell, which is a particular commitment, like for instance, to become a blood cell, involves this kind of circuits, lock-on circuits. One mo moment. A transient signal that tells the cell you're going to be a blood cell isn't needed after a while cell will remain a blood cell. Of course, we can reprogram, we can. I mean, in the last decade, there's been a breakthrough where you can take uh, cells like skin cells and reprogram them back to become embryonic stem cells. That's very exciting because then you can maybe take our own cells and make new, new organs for transplantation, etc. And that's done by, uh, by basically erasing the state. You can erase the state by genetic manipulations. But that's, uh, that's the memory. Yeah. How would you replicate yeah. itself? It's, it's hard to maintain the expression of the genes. So, uh, good question. How can you maintain this through cell division? So, if X and Y are present, let's say, in the human cell at 100,000 copies per cell, and they divide into 50,000 copies, that's enough to keep them going. That the proteins themselves carry the memory into the daughter cells. Did I explain myself? So, it's a kind of epigenetic memory. It's not in the DNA, 
It's in the dynamic state of the system. You mean a po just a positive feedback loop? Yeah. So the question, uh, yeah. So the yeah, the point is that X with a positive feedback loop can also provide memory. And I think you got that in one of your exercises. You can, but it's very fragile. Because for X to be, for this to to work, I'll just uh, blitz create blitz an answer here. X. Fun this is X and this is X production. It needs, and this is X production when X, uh, and this is X removal. And these are the steady states to an, uh, two stable steady states and one unstable steady state. If I, if I increase removal, no more two steady states. So if you can build it, but it's, it's fragile. This is much more difficult to break this memory. So I can think about that. I know this was a bit fast for some people. You can look at the movie and <laughs> consider it. What about this one? Um, in this situation, <coughs> you start with e x and y. X and here I'm going to draw z this uh, z here. Let's imagine that Z here represses X and activates Y, just for example. If I'm starting with X high and Y low, that's one steady state. Turn on Z. So X is high, Y is low. I turn on Z, what happens to X? It becomes, re production is repressed, it goes down, down, down. What happens to Y? It gets activated, and also uh, X is no longer there, so it, can, it gets activated doubly. So what you get is a kind of um, flip-flop where X present Y naught turns into the opposite. What is this good for? What's the difference? The difference is that the double positive feedback loop, double positive, these guys control the same genes, and the double negative, they control different classes of genes. One example where this is used is in an organism even simpler than E. coli. That's a virus that infects E. coli. So E. coli is tiny, one micron. But it also has problems in life. Like organisms of every scale have problems at their scale, right? So the phage lambda, this is E. coli, is this kind of spaceship designed creature with le legs and, and a DNA. And it knows how to inject its DNA into E. coli. And its DNA inserts itself into the DNA of E. coli and hijacks the protein-making machinery of E. coli and starts making the proteins of itself and the DNA of itself and makes a hundred new phages and bursts E. coli open and they go and infect new E. coli. This phage. So this is viruses that prey on bacteria. <coughs> phage lambda has two states. If it goes into a healthy cell, it actually doesn't kill it. It just puts its DNA silently into the DNA of E. coli and makes only one protein. One repressor that activates itself and represses everything. Uh, it represses, um, binds one place in the DNA and represses a second uh, protein. So this is the only thing that happens. It, it just makes a few copies of this repressor, and then represses all the genes in the in phage, and that's all. But if E. coli becomes damaged, actually, the same system that you E. coli uses to identify its own damage, this Rec A protein that uh, I mentioned one time, that identifies single-stranded breaks that happens when DNA is damaged, that same protein, this phage, is reads it, and that DNA damage 
signal cuts this repressor, freeing a production of X2. And X2 represses this repressor and activates all the phage genes that make 100 new phage and kill the E. coli. So the rats escape from a sinking ship. If this E. coli is damaged, make new phage. This, uh, this phage actually has two uh, states. One where it's quiet, called lysogenic phase, and one where it's lethal. And this two f these two states are controlled by a double negative <coughs> feedback loop, which is a positive feedback loop made of two negatives. That's a classic example that occurs ac across organisms. Um, so we're, we're it's a very pl good moment. We finished uh, our scanning of network motifs in the tra sensory transcription networks. Some of the motifs we just touched in developmental transcription networks, the global structure of the network, timing, memory. It's a great time to take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> and I'll see you um, next Tuesday. <laughs>